Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change power and success in the world. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Trade increases the wealth and glory of a country, but her real strength and stamina are to be looked for among the cultivators of the land. Is a quote by William Pitt, the first Earl of Chatham, who served as the Prime Minister of Great Britain in the late 1700s. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today, as our guest, through her upbringing on a farm and continued engagement with the community, and in particular regional Australia, illustrates how we all can adapt and develop the qualities of strength and resilience for these challenging times while seizing the opportunities ahead. Our guest is Marnie Baker, Managing Director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Limited. Marnie has been with the organisation since 1989, was an executive since 2000, and was appointed Managing Director in 2018. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite, world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I'm your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blend & Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In this episode, Marnie shares with us the big picture of the Australian banking industry, the need for deregulation, and why the best thing for consumers is competition. We learn how Bendigo and Adelaide are changing the way people are thinking about banking, the creation of the digital bank, and the broader move towards a cashless society. We find out how Bendigo and Adelaide have led some of the most important innovations in Australian banking, and how they are giving more than a helping hand to businesses and individuals during the current crisis. Finally, we discuss the government's response and coordination with the banking sector, and through the lens of a CEO, navigate the ambiguity of the times as we examine and communicate the big opportunities coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, including the pace of decision-making, the focus on digital, the strengthening of relationships, and the time to invest in rural and regional Australia. So sit back and enjoy Desire to Deliver. Marnie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. How does a CEO running the fifth largest bank in this country start off life on the country farm? Uh, look, I'm, I feel like I've had a very privileged um, you know, upbringing and I know it's held me in good stead, I think, for the role that I'm actually undertaking now. It's amazing what you learn in your youth and farming's a, a tough gig. Yeah. And you know, I've learned a lot about adaptability, about resilience, community, yeah. coming from a a town of only around 2,000 people and how you can't rely on others. Uh, you need to support each other as a community and, and do things yourself. Isn't there a barometer you're fairly well known for, for calling uh, out? I, I, I did think about that after I said it and I thought, I bet you that gets picked up. I called it the bullshit barometer. And, and it, uh, when you're from uh, the country and especially smaller yep. towns where everyone knows you, you do need to make sure that you're honest. You need to make sure you're authentic because uh, it can come back to bite you because country people really can see through all that. Are you still out on the land? Yeah, it was interesting. There was an article and it talked about me still coming from the land. Now, Mm. I had to have a a, a bit of a giggle at the time because, we're yes, we're on 20 acres uh, just outside of Bendigo, but for those people who are farmers will know that 20 acres is not a farm. At the best, you could call it a hobby farm. Okay. And how tough is it out there in, in rural Australia? Yeah, look, you know, it's very hard to give a blanket um, response to that Mm. because Australia is a big country and at any point in time, you know, part of the country can be in drought and the other part can be be flooded. Mm. Uh, So it does depend. But um, overall, you know, I think despite the natural disasters and the things that 
that uh, regional people do contend with, um, you know, that's just part of their everyday life, this season's looking to be uh, quite good. So despite what's going on from a COVID uh, perspective, yeah. uh, Agri is actually doing quite well. And Marnie, you had ambitions from what I can understand when you're going to leave school to pursue a career as a teacher. Yes, yes, I, I was. My whole life I was um, talked about actually being a teacher. And, and if you talk about sliding doors, there was no, not at any point in time did I have banking on the radar. I was going to go off and, and do a teaching degree, but at that point in time, there was really no jobs for teachers as they were coming out of a university or college as it was in my time. Okay. And so at the 11th hour, um, when I was making my decision about preferences for college, I thought, well, I don't do too bad at maths. I'll give accounting a, a go. And that was a sliding door. Changed into accounting, took me down a, a path and again, an opportunity through a trustee company that then was acquired by a building society that then became a bank. And that's my history. And I guess the question is, why stick around for so long? Um, I think it's really important that whoever you uh, work for or whoever you, uh, the organisation that you join, that you're really aligned uh, with it. You can tell when people aren't if they don't stay uh, too long. But, you know, I was very lucky, I suppose, to find an organisation with a really deep purpose about feeding into prosperity and not off it. And that really hit home with me because I was very aligned to my own sort of value set. Mm -hmm. So I think I've stayed so long because I truly believe in the purpose of the organisation and, and the values that it exhibits. And just on that, money, because there's a lot of doubters out there why, you know, the consumers have some views on, on banks in general. What are those values that you made you stick so long? You just mentioned a couple, but there's got to be more than that. Yeah. Oh, well, it's treating people how you'd like to be treated yourself. Um, you know, we have been through a period of time where there was a, a lot of doubt uh, around the banking industry and who they were there for. The organisation I work for has really always had customers and, and their communities because communities have got to be healthy to sustain healthy people. Yep. Um, but those sort of values of just integrity and doing the right thing you know, by people um, is core, I think, to our organisation and it's really something that I personally live by. So, so what's changed so much over the last 30 years? There's been a huge amount of change. Um, you know, so sometimes I have to pinch myself a bit that it actually has been 30 years. But I think back to when I first started, um, mm. it was really just coming into the computer age at the time. So we were, we've were we moved uh, early on in my career from the old card ledger system to computers. Yeah. Um, back then, you went to the bank to get your cash out. Right, and yeah. it was all cash, really. And you, you dealt in cash and, and it wasn't any, you know, like the internet hadn't even been born uh, at that point in time. And technology has been a huge, a huge change to not only banking, but I think to society as a whole. So, um, and I also think uh, from a credit perspective, I think, you know, that's much more available mm. uh, to, to all Australians now than probably when I first started in banking too. So there's been a significant amount of change in that 30 years. But also at the same time, is it true when you walk down the street, people walk up and say, g'day and hello and everything else? Yeah, so um, that is one thing, and I, I think that's a real positive. So living and working in a regional city such as uh, as Bendigo, mm. um, it's not too big that people don't know who you are. And whether I'm at the supermarket or at the football with my, uh, with my boys, people will come up and tell me uh, what Bendigo and Adelaide Bank is doing right and what it's doing wrong um, and they take no qualms in telling me that and and I think that like I said is a real positive because you never lose focus on customers and um, you know that's whole grassroots um, you can't get too big for your boots but they'll bring you right back down. Has the the needs for the customer or the wants from the customer dramatically changed? Yeah I think they have. Okay. Um, you know I, I, you know we talked about before, about you know, thirty years ago, yep. and and going to your branch for your cash, but you went to, you went to the bank uh, to have any discussions around your financial needs, yep. um, you know, and it was a little bit like um, the banks had all the power and not the consumers mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, and and you went to the bank, you had to wait for an appointment and go and have an appointment and and beg and plead that you could um, you know get the funds that you needed, a loan that you needed, for example, but. Yep. 
But I think all the power is really transferred to the consumer and to the customer, which I think is a great thing. But they're demanding and dictating now on their own terms. And that comes down to, I want to bank wherever and whenever I like and however I like. And if you can't help me, I will go and find someone else who actually can do that. So there's a lot more available to customers now. And I think it's a lot easier for customers to be uh, making choices that make sense to them, not fitting into what makes sense to a financial institution. Okay. So on that same theme, in this challenging period of time, what are you doing for customers? Yeah, so it is a really challenging time for a lot of individuals and businesses and especially small to medium businesses. So uh, we've been out with uh, a lot of relief packages, deferral of repayments, both for individuals on their mortgages, but also for businesses, uh, packages that provide some working capital, just some cash flow uh, to enable like I said, especially small businesses get through when they're not actually able to operate to their full extent or at all. In some industries, we've looked at um, the waiving uh, of fees where necessary. We made some reductions to interest rates also, especially around fixed interest rates. But what we've tried to do is really tailor any solutions to the individual needs because that, because everyone is very different and it's not just a one size fits all. And as an organisation, we've got a really, really close connection, you know, with our customers. So ours has been a hands-on approach. It's, it's it used to be um, going and seeing customers. Now, you know, it's, it's on the phone, uh, but it's actually contacting all of our customers and just seeing how they are, what they believe that they've got ahead of them and what we can do to help them. Because I do believe that the larger organisations, they're in a better position, in a sense, having stronger balance sheets um, and, and cash flow but we've got an obligation to assist the smaller to medium businesses to get through this period of time because it's going to take us all to ensure that the economy recovers. And Marnie, are are customers actually uh, shifting at the moment or are they staying put? I think a a lot of the time uh, they're staying put and I believe that's because, you know, it's better to stay with an organisation that knows you than trying to introduce yourself to a new organisation. But saying that, there's also some great deals out there for customers, especially for borrowers. Like I said, with with record low interest rates, there's some terrific uh, rates available for customers. So I think one is about the relationship and maintain that relationship, but also, you know, um, when every every cent counts as it does, um, also making sure that you're getting the best deal for you and hopefully we're doing that for our customers. And on a broader point, Marty, is the government and the RBA's response been effective or do you think it needs a little bit more fine-tuning? Oh, look, I, I've been um, actually really impressed with how how quick the stakeholders have, have sort of got together and how robust the conversations have been. You know, I, I was worried that in these times the old political banter yeah, exactly. uh, starts, but but I think that's been put on the on the back burner. The way that we've seen, you know, all financial institutions, so not just banks, but all financial institutions, building societies, credit unions, uh, and others that have come to the table with regulators and with government, trying to solve the immediate challenges um, for individuals and 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 for businesses but also now to be thinking longer term about how we work together to ensure that we're able to to bounce back from this and bounce back as quickly um, as we can. Um, But I am very mindful that there's a long way to go yet. So this is a a long haul for everyone and it's it's our role to be there to support uh, support our customers um, through this and play our role because we do have a role and a very privileged role that we play in the broader economy. Did we um did we cut interest rates too quickly? Uh, look, I think that was a a, a lever that um, absolutely uh, assists uh, and does assist. I mean, if you if you can get rates down, it makes it more affordable for uh, businesses to be able to operate. I am always very mindful that mm. there's a cohort of customers that are left out of that. Uh, discussion a lot of the time and remembering there's a lot of especially older uh, retirees that are relying very much on the interest on their accounts and as we can see with the share market and what's going on around dividends um, that becomes you know even more important but um, you know look yes I think the Reserve Bank Governor and and, uh, the Reserve Bank you know weighed all that up in making the decisions that they did. And it's going to be a combination of things that's going to assist us through. And coming out of this, Marnie, if we do think positively, um, 
there's discussion around the whole banking sector and deregulation. What does that actually mean for someone like you, your bank and what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I've been, you know, very mindful and probably very vocal and my predecessors the, the same. Um, the best thing for consumers is competition. Uh, that will always get the best results. And, you know, if there's one thing that I'm concerned about, Greg, through this is that uh, rightly so, the focus has been on stability and robustness and ensuring that, that we're in a really solid position to work through this. But it does concern me sometimes that competition is left out of that um, uh, that conversation and, you know, th- there isn't a level playing field at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's great that we're seeing that new entrants coming into, um, especially into the banking system or the financial services uh, industry, and that's terrific because I'm actually a big advocate for that. Okay. Um, but people forget that there's over 100 ADIs or over 100 financial institutions yeah. in the market, and yeah. yet, you know, around 85% of market share actually sits with four. That's right, yeah. So there's something not quite right there, and, and a big part of that is actually regulation and the impost. There's not a level playing field when it comes to regulation between uh, the larger players in the market um, and the rest of the market. So what do we need to do, Marnie? Yeah, so I think there's a number of things, but, you know, and we continue to have conversations with uh, regulators, but I'll give you a, a good example. So the capital frameworks that the banks is a part of their supporting the assets that we write or the, the lending that we write, uh, the risk weights or the capital to support the loans that we write, there is a big gap between what a major bank or a larger organisation who uses a different uh, risk-based model yep. has to apply to a loan than what the rest of the industry has to apply to a loan. So, for example, Greg, you taking out a home loan with Bendigo and Adelaide Bank versus taking out a home loan with a major bank, you are the same person, the same risk, the same property security, etc. but we would have to apply much more capital to that loan if you took that out with us. And that just doesn't seem to make sense to me. So are they listening, Marnie, or look, how much longer are we going to keep going backwards and forwards from, from your perspective? Because obviously, um, you know, we, as Australians, we do want choice. We need choice. Yes, yeah. Uh, look, I think that they are listening. Um, uh, I think that they're weighing up a whole heap of things uh, at the moment, but I'll keep pushing that bandwagon, as I know others in the industry will as well. But um, we do need fundamental change to be able to ensure that we do actually have competition. And do you think COVID-19 is actually driving a lot of that? You know, because it is a, quite often when crisis comes, change happens yeah. as a result. Do you think, are you seeing that? I, I think it gives us an opportunity to, because yeah, okay. absolutely it, it gets you to address the structural side of, um, you know, the frameworks and how things are established. And uh, I think there is a real opportunity here and now to do that, and we'll keep those conversations going. Okay, and look, from your side of things, for Bendigo and Adelaide, where is the opportunity as you come out of this out of this period? Well, I think there's a significant opportunity for for our organisation. Um, you know, if you think about what's happened through COVID and and through any any shock or crisis, uh, you know, it makes people reevaluate things. And there's some silver linings, I think, to come from um, the period of time that we're going through. And that's that we've, you know, we've reassessed what's important and what sort of is priorities in our life. Being forced home to be working from home and that reconnection with your families and trying to get that, you know, that work-life balance. We're appreciating and recognising that we need to look after the more vulnerable parts of our society, um, you know, including our, our elderly. Um, you know, everyone all of a sudden has, has thought very local and very community-based um, because it's their neighbours that they're, they're looking after and they're, and they're worried about. And, you know, at the very core of who we are is really about communities and the strengthening of communities. So, you know, our purpose and, and what drives us and the very essence of what makes us very different to others in the financial services market has really just been even more honed through this period of time. And look, the world has shrunk by what more than one percent of GDP globally. No doubt, we'll probably get to unemployment over ten percent, or at least that I suspect. You, as a leader, are going to be leading in a whole new world. You know, where where do you put your time, Marnie? 
And what's what's yeah, your well, style going to be? Well, I think you put your time um, uh, squarely with your customers. You know, this is where it actually really does matter and it really does count. This is about giving a, you know, a helping hand to, not a, not a handout because I don't think they're sustainable, yeah. um, but a, you know, a hand up to the people who are going to need us through this. Um, we are going to see unemployment levels that we haven't seen for a, a long, long period of time, if ever. Yeah. And so there's going to be a lot of new ways of thinking uh, about how we go about things um, and the support that we're going to need to uh, require. And, you know, the government uh, has a tough job ahead of us, but I think we can't just rely on the government to be uh, solving these issues for us. This takes all of us as a society and, you know, as businesses and as a business as part of that society, it takes it takes us as well. Um, putting our minds to how we actually how we actually do work our way through this in the long term, and how we actually use this to to learn and perhaps make changes that's going to ensure that should we ever have any of uh, anything like this happen again, which I'm sure it will into the future, yeah. uh, that we're much mm. better placed to be able to ride our way through it. Money as a search firm, we've been asked to look at senior people backgrounds in technology, both in the boardroom and in the exec teams. Where do you see your play in in, in technology going forward uh, in the impact to the customer? Yeah, so very, you know, we're, we're seeing it as as I'm sure others are seeing it, a, a real move to, I'll say digitising because it's not only um, customers themselves that are accessing more things online, but also within your own organisations and a lot more automation and even using things like artificial intelligence to improve the processes that you you have. Um, we've seen that move and we've been um, mindful of that move for some time now. And our approach has been uh, around partnering. And you'll probably see that with some of the examples in uh, our partnering uh, with Ferocia for things like our, like Up, yeah. um, TikTok, uh, another partnership that we have around, you know, uh, loan origination and assessment. Like, Marnie, do you want to sort of uh, talk us through a bit more yeah. of that? Because a lot of people may not know what the strengths of those are. Yeah, certainly. So I'll start with TikTok. So that's a company, a, a fintech company based out of Adelaide, and we've uh, partnered with them. Uh, they b- have bought the first instant home loan to the market globally. Wow. Uh, that was launched back, I think, in July 2017. Yep. Uh, and in essence, what that platform or that technology um provides is the ability to actually get a home loan all the way through from first uh, your application through to settlement of funds in your account by, um, you know, and I think, you know, we have timed it. And if you have everything available uh, at the time, you can get a home loan in 53 minutes. So it's a terrific service for, for customers. It's a way of using technology now to assist customers through um, what has been, you know, I'd say a fairly arduous process uh, for most in the past. We've had a relationship with Ferocia, uh, who are, uh, again, a fintech company based out of Melbourne. We partnered with them probably eight years ago now on our mobile banking uh, system. So uh, they developed that for us, which has received numerous awards uh, over that time. Um, but during that period of time, we, we uh, were talking about, you know, launching a digital bank, which we launched now back in uh, October mm-hmm. 2018. Mm-hmm. And it's a, uh, a digital bank that's very much focused on the younger demographic. Mm-hmm. You know, we were very mindful that we probably hadn't had the traction in the younger demographic that we would have liked. And we realised that they wanted to bank very differently than what people had traditionally banked. I was also very mindful having uh, children myself uh, or young adults myself and it worried me that they were growing up in a world uh, where there was no cash and how did you how did you understand the value of money and not you know it's very easy using a card or electronic means just for, to ship money around and and I think you lose touch and so there was this financial awareness and literacy that I was also keen on so Ferocia um, uh, and worked with us and they developed a, a digital bank that's predominantly or initially focused at savings uh, and spending. So how to save effortlessly and um, spend wisely. Okay. 
And it's been a huge hit. It's been a huge hit with that demographic that I spoke about. And um, I think it's changing the way uh, people think about banking. Um, and so you're seeing some really good behaviours occurring in that customer base, which I think is hitting the concerns that I had uh, initially. And we're really only very much at the start of that. Um, and we're looking to how we further develop out that platform, perhaps to, um, you know, to credit products and perhaps looking to other other uh, products or services that are that are going to actually meet the growing needs of that demographic as they actually move through their own life cycle. And Marty, are we going to come or become a cashless society? Uh, look, I, I would have said uh, pre-COVID that that was a long way away. Oh yeah, exactly. um, I, I think it's very interesting uh, what we've seen even in our you know ATM networks. The you know the. I think our own ATM networks, I think probably right across the industry, dropped about uh, 25%. Right, okay. Um, you know, you're seeing people using their cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, as, as other organisations, did have uh, a number of uh, older customers who were still on passbooks or checkbooks. Yes. You know, we had a concerted effort to get to those customers and, um, you know, show them how to use a, a debit card. Uh, so that should things really shut down, that they still had access to be able to pay for things over the phone or, or however they needed to. And the willingness um, of that demographic, given the situation, most of those customers now um, are using electronic means to transact. So there's been a really quick shift. So it wouldn't surprise me if cash one day was phased out. Interesting. You, you've only got to see the Reserve Bank putting more cash out into the market by uh, the uh, issuing of bonds. Uh, I mean, that's not done. It's mm. not done through the Mint now. No. Uh, you know, that's actually just done on a computer. Can I ask the other question, which comes up all the time regarding, you know, there's Benigo and Adelaide, as you say, bank number five, and there's others. Are we really going to see the shake-up and potential mergers of other banks coming to join Benigo and Adelaide? And does it really make sense these days if you're talking about the, the era of fintechs, creating of technology and new markets from that point, as opposed to actually going into bed with somebody else and you inherit legacy systems? Yeah, well, well, regardless of COVID, you know, we were already in a low credit growth environment. And usually in those environments, you'd see a lot of, you know, M&A activity. Yeah. Um, which we didn't necessarily see. And I put that down to a lot that, you know, what are the benefits now Mm. of that activity? Because, you know, in the past it was, you know, around a scale that gave you an opportunity to diversify into markets you hadn't uh, been in. I mean, geographically, so you might have extended your branch network. Really the advantages now are around, um, you know, technology. So you're really looking to... Uh, step up in a sense of technology and um, you know I'm not too sure what is available in the market that's actually going to give you that step change uh, aside from what um, you're working on yourself and and look and we've taken an approach we've we've very much you know our strategy is very much around that digital transformation and taking a much um, larger step there and you know we've got a really clear strategy that we're executing on and that's where our focus uh, has been and will continue to be uh, in this short term. Money, how important is it for the federal government to maybe get a little bit more serious about the investment uh, the regional investment um, in regards to migration? There's certainly got to be an opportunity here thinking the next 10, 20 yeah. years. Yeah, look, I, I'm, you know, you, you've touched on a subject that's very, I'm very passionate about. Um, okay. Like I said, living and working in regional Australia my whole life uh, absolutely needs to be. And if there's anything through COVID that's shown you is, is the weakness of having 40% of your population in two major cities. It's- uh, you know, there is so much to offer in regional Australia and, um, the more that we can look to uh, investment in regional Australia, the more that we can look to uh, decentralising, I'll say, you know, services and, and functions from uh, the major cities. I think that's only going to be good for the whole economy, you know, of Australia. So I'm, I, I am a huge advocate um, and you're going to hear me talking a, a bit more about this um, okay. because I think there's, it gives us an opportunity right now yeah, agree. to do some more things um, in, in regional Australia. And you have a look at jurisdictions like, like the US. Most businesses uh, aren't actually situated in those main cities. No. 
they're actually out in regional areas. Uh, we need to be doing a lot more of that. What's holding us back? Is it fear of foreign ownership? Uh, no, I, you know, I think it's deep rooted to um, some of the, the myths or perhaps some of it was real and the practicalities of people needing to uh, go to get educated and the only um, education facilities were in big cities or well, healthcare, you know, was in yeah. big cities. A lot of that is changing. And again, technology, it's broken down the barriers uh, now. With technology, there's no reason why you can't be educated and seek education exactly where you are. So, you know, one of the phrases is live and work where you love. And you know, I, I just I just think you can you can live where you love now and still work for an organisation. It doesn't really matter, and that's another silver lining I think to come out of COVID. And you know, it's really just accelerated us into the future. About it really doesn't matter where you're working from, you know, for the organisation. So we're not restricted now by the bricks and mortar. Look, we're still a small population. What 25, 26 million people. And we are seeing the growth, as you said earlier, of the fintechs. Are they really going to have an impact? Oh, look, I think they're already having an impact. Um, the thing that I love about fintechs is that they, they've they looked at a, a, a customer journey or a customer experience and they've picked out a certain part of that customer experience and they've honed in on that and reimagined it and done it really, really well. And um, that lifts the bar for everyone. So every time a fintech is doing something like that, it means that everyone else in the industry needs to lift as well. So it can only be great for consumers to have that sort of innovation and reimagination occurring because it pushes everyone and there's not complacency. Okay, now let me ask you the difficult question. If I'm a customer of one of those four pillar banks or your bank, why, why haven't you guys got the imagination then? Why do I have to well, rely I on the fintech to, to drive it? It's just a... A broad question, uh, I guess. No, no, it's, it's a good question because I think they do have that and they are reimagining it because they're not bankers ah. uh, and they're thinking about it from a customer perspective. And I think, you know, bankers, regardless of being consumers themselves, will think about it from a banker's perspective. You become a bit too institutionalised. Mm -hmm. You know, however, I do like to think that we're very different uh, in our organisation because innovation has been a core to our organisation. And as far back as I can go back and even further, I mean, you know, Bendigo introduced uh, visa cards to Australia. So oh, we, we bought debit cards uh, to Australia. We were the first to introduce the mortgage offset account. We were, uh, uh, there's probably a bit of discrepancy whether we were a week apart, but I'll say we we're the first to bring internet banking uh, to, uh, to Australia. We had green home loans and green products well before climate change was on the agenda. I think community banking is one of the, the biggest innovations yep. that you've seen in, in banking in the last 50 years. Um, you know, uh, up, first digital bank in Australia. Um, you know, I think we're fairly innovative. So we're good at uh, reimagining the experience ourselves. And, and but, but, like I said before, there is absolutely something in partnering with others and looking to people outside of your industry who will bring different thoughts. And if I've been banking with one of these banks since from the age of four or five because they turned up to my primary school with that money box all those years ago, am I going to change? Am I going to pull my, you know, go for all that hassle money and come across to your bank? It's, um, and that is another myth that we need to bust. Okay. It's not that much of a hassle. And in fact, uh, your bank actually needs to do most of that work on your behalf. Right. Uh, so it's not as big, a, and that's up to us to actually show that um, and to make it easy for people to be able to move. I think it actually is quite easy uh, to move. Um, but, you know, we, we want competition. We absolutely want competition. And, um, you know, I also think that the younger generation coming through now, I don't like to give them labels, um, but the younger generation coming through now absolutely will move. I think there's a distrust of large institutions uh, in this younger generation yeah. and they are looking for something different. And they're looking for a purpose or an organisation with a strong purpose uh, that they actually can align to. Um, you know, it, it's very different than the generations that have gone before who may have actually had a bit more, like I said, complacency uh, about their, their banking. Um, you know, I think this next generation is, is teaching us a thing or two.
Okay. How does a CEO during this period of time, particularly with all this ambiguity and unknown out there, lead their team? What's what's the agenda? What's the rhythm? How do you communicate money? Yeah, well, communicate, I think, is the key uh, to it. You cannot over-communicate in a time of uncertainty, and that's not only directly with your team but with your whole organisation. We, we, within our own organisation, have been meeting daily. Um, we've been communicating and I've been communicating with the organisation, you know, every week, if not a few times uh, sort of during the week. But I think you lead with honesty. Uh, I think you need to be open and honest during periods of time like this. This is where you shouldn't be scared to show your vulnerability your human side also uh, because this is this is new times for everyone it's not only new times for myself as a as, as a leader um, no one else has been through a, you know a pandemic like this either so we're all learning so this is not a time to think you know it all this is a time to you know to seek the input from everyone around you but I think it's you know I think it's leading with that sort of uh, vulnerability and and humility uh, but also uh, with a sense of purpose and strength as well. So hopefully, and, and only history will tell you how leaders go through periods of time, so hopefully history will say that, um, you know, as an organisation myself and all the rest of the leaders in our organisation um, uh, do that well. Marnie, a couple of things have come out of our conversations with Chairman and Chief Execs and some observations. Firstly, we're in the boardroom. We're probably going to be looking for people all around more business skills um, to help in the decision-making, particularly to support the exec team, that uh, the exec teams may want to trim and get a bit more lean. And one big thing which has come out of this whole crisis is the speed of decision-making. And therefore, yeah. roll that back is why wasn't there the speed previously? What's, what's your thoughts around those sort of yeah. comments? Yeah, so, so in relation to speed, absolutely. Um, you know, we've even seen within our own organisation, uh, you know, we had plans to implement things and that, that may have taken months, if not towards years. And all of a sudden, you know, something can be implemented in 72 hours. Yeah, well. So, you know, you, you've got to actually have a look at that. And that's some of the things that we're working on. So you want to be actually working at that sort of speed. Is at the end of the committees um, in that all regard? All the time then? with that sort of urgency, but without the crisis that, yeah. you know, that um, instigates it. Well, look, so, one of the yes. comments, Marty, is cut the committees. Yeah, yeah, and again, um, you will see how a organisation should function rather than how it does function in times of crisis. So people will go around the things that actually get in the way. They will go straight to the areas or the people they need to rather than through a hierarchy. You know, it, it is really telling through these periods of times and you really need to take a lot of notice of that because it does enable you to to look at your operating model and to change the things that need to be changed to ensure that you can retain some of those benefits that you actually get through a crisis. If you look at your operating model, you're then going to be looking at your market. Is the customer going to change a lot in the sense of their needs going forward from this, from this period onwards, Marnie, and how you're going to adjust your model to, to match their requirements? Like what sort of tests are we doing in that sense? Yeah, so we have been retesting our strategy, um, you know, as you should do through these periods of time. And the sort of key priority markets that we were focused on haven't changed. Okay. And in fact, uh, it's probably um, has given even more focus on those sort of key priority markets. Uh, what changes may be what they need during this period of time in the short to medium versus the, the longer term. And so just making sure that you have, you know, in your kit bag all of those things that are going to be needed to assist and support uh, those customers. But, you know, we, we are very much, you see, you know, a focus on the younger demographic through, you know, a partnership through UP. We very much, you know, focus in on the everyday Australian. Um, you know, we are a grassroots organisation. Uh, that's where we focus on very much the small to medium business, you know, being represented in over 500 communities Australia-wide, um, being there on the ground and supporting small to medium business. And, of course, we've got a significant, um, you know, rural bank business as well, servicing agribusiness and more particularly family farms and family corporate uh, farms. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, our, they're our focus areas. Um, but we are here to serve, you know, 
all Australians. There's going to be a fair amount of change probably in the next six months in key roles in Australia and in the executive leadership profiles. Do you see a style of change in actual leadership itself? I'll be interested in your point of view, Marnie. What is the you know, chief executive of the future going to really start to, to look like? There's been quite a significant turnover of more recent times. And you can absolutely see in the majority of those appointments a real change in the style uh, and the type of, of leader. I believe the leader for today really does need to be um, a genuine leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think people are looking for that. They're sick of all the, you know, all the talk and the whatever. They they actually want to see the human uh, behind the person that's uh, that's leading. Like I said before, I think that sort of vulnerability. It's it's you you don't know everything as a leader, and and you know that's that's reality. So don't pretend like you know everything. Um, I also do think, and and you know, you touched on the subject there about the, you know, the younger generation. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm 30 plus years into my career, mm-hmm. and when you get that far into your career, you spend a lot of time talking about what you've learned in the past and your experience. I, and we, you know, I've seen that before, or I've done that. You know, I love. I love spending time with, and it's a, you know, I spend a lot of time with the younger people in our organisation, who they don't have the past, so they're only looking forward, and they're about what if and why don't we and why can't we. I think you've got to be open to all of that. I mean, the the younger generation is absolutely determining the way forward, and so they should because they're actually the consumers of the future. What characteristics or capabilities? would impress you now as you say teams may change and we're all going through this process yeah. what are you looking for money yeah look authenticity uh passion i think you've got to have the right mix of experience so i do agree with you there is you know there is experience and i know boards very much looking at the different experience they need on boards yep. i really want to see someone and with a proven desire to um deliver on a purpose money how do you go about deepening the relationships with your staff. You said communicate earlier. That's yeah. that's pretty hard when we're sitting and you know, operating from home. So how do you go about it? If I'm just talking about this specific period, which does make it harder because I am very much a um, uh, a person who, like, like I, I don't have an office. So you walk the, I, you're the walk the floor CEO? I, I, yeah. Um, you know, when I came into this role, um, the office that was there, we're an open plan organization but the office that was there had changed into a meeting room to be used by everyone I just you know I I've grown up in an organization of learning so much from from so many people and I just think living in and breathing in amongst everyone we all learn off each other and you know so I'm a big one for that so I'm, I'm very accessible and you know I spend a lot of time with staff and that can be in one-on-ones or it can be in broader groups or whatever it may be I know they called it social distancing, but it was actually physical distancing that came into play yeah. because I think we've got more social over that, this period of time. I think we've found ways and tools mm-hmm. to actually do more socialisation with each other uh, in a work sense and, and in a personal sense. I think the old-fashioned pick up the phone and talk to people rather than email or text message, you know, has really come back yeah. um, in vogue. So, you know, I, I think through this, I, I've probably spoken to more people than what I would have pre-COVID through this period of time and had and probably had deeper conversations, yeah. to be to be honest, because you, your first thought is always about how they're going. Yep. So, you know, you get to a deeper level of a conversation with people as well. So I think it's really important and I think it's really important for leaders to be uh, and to be true leaders is to, you know, to be aligned and in sync with how the people in your organisation are feeling. So, well, yeah, let, me, let me roll it back. a lot of time with people. Okay, let me roll it back a couple of years. Did you always want to be a CEO? No. No? No, no. <laughs> okay, so how did it no, come about? It was never. it was never in a grand plan. It was never, in fact, I've never had a grand plan. Um, okay. I know, you know, a lot of people are big around, making sure you have goals and plans and so you can get where you need to get to. Oh, I never had a plan. You know, I, I worked for an organisation that I that I love, I'm really passionate about and I really believe in. That was enough for me. Um, 
you know, I've, I've spent uh, probably a lot of time being the support to CEOs in a sense of, you know, uh, as a chief customer officer or the, the COO or the, you know, I, I saw myself in that role. I didn't see myself as the CEO, but um, others obviously did and, and uh, here I am. So giving it's, it a red hot go. Okay, you're giving it a red hot go and you are well known. How hard is it? How have you found it? Oh, look, um, baptism of fire. There's not, you know, there's nothing about um, sort of easing into a, a, a role. So, you know, like I said, it's just over 18 months and the Royal Commission yeah. day one, you know, we've had bushfires, you know, we're in the lowest interest rate environment we've ever been, throw a pandemic on top of that. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm... Uh, I, I sort of shrug my shoulders a bit now and think, well, whatever you throw at me, it doesn't really matter now. I, I, the first 18 months has um, taught me how to be pretty adaptable. Okay. So when you call it a day and pass the baton over to somebody else, what's the legacy going to be? What are we going to remember Marnie for? Um, I hope the legacy will be um, around uh, taking this business into its next phase. Okay. So, you know, we're really lucky in this organisation that we've had terrific leaders. Um, you know, it's in our 162 years, our purpose actually goes right back to the start. And so there's been a continuity of purpose and really knowing who we are as an organisation. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of organisations that struggle with that. Um, so we've got something that's really special at the core. So coming into a role like this, it's really it's not about having to determine who you are or or even you know where you're sort of looking to to go in a mac in a in a big macro sense. It's actually about helping an organisation to take the next step to ensure its relevance and to be able to grow as an organisation and keep meeting the needs of more and more Australians. So you know, I hope that uh, my legacy is that you will be able to see a really step change. Um, in being able to, you know, meet our customers' needs and um, be an organisation that is, is you know, leading uh, the way customer experience should be. So, yeah, it's a pretty – I've got a pretty big ask of myself. And in that regard, are you sort of relishing the opportunity? Yeah, in some ways, um, in some ways you do because it really does uh, give you the opportunity to put a mark on things that you know and, mm. and being with an organisation for over 30 years, mm. you know, I know what needs to change. Um, it must be very hard for CEOs coming new to an organisation. You know, that's a more difficult thing to get used to an organisation and all its nuances as well as actually, you know, manage and run an organisation. So I really intimately know this organisation. Um, so I know... I know where are the things that need to change. I know what needs to change, um, and I know how we can how we can change as an organisation and keep evolving. Which is contrary to a lot of other people out there who say you should have no more than five to seven years in one organisation, money, and then move on. But I assume you say that you, that you know everything around the organisation and probably can be far more effective because of that. Yeah, and also too, we're an organisation that's grown significantly over that time too, through a lot of um, M&A activity, but also through organic uh, growth as well. So the organisation that I started with over 30 years ago is very different in its makeup now to what it was uh, back then. Like I said, the core purpose is still the same, uh, but, you know, what it looks like, what it's got available for its customers, um, you know, et cetera. Um, is very different from when I first started. So it has evolved. And I, and I can tell you I've never stayed more than uh, more than a few years in any one role in the organisation. So I've been right around the organisation and, you know, and, and that in some sense uh, I agree with in you don't want to be in the same role uh, for too long. Marty, interesting topic is always around gender. You've come from the country, so as you say, you're, you've seen, you know, you've got the bullshit factor squared away. But how tough is it for females to come through? Yeah, um, in our organisation, not not tough. As an organisation, diversity has always been and inclusion has always been a key thing for our organisation. But, you know, I do see, you know, across the industry and across um, broader industries um, that it is still really tough for women. 
I mean, we, we're, we're one of only two ASX-listed companies in the top 200 ASX-listed companies that have a female CEO and a female chair. That's right. Now, that's astounding. That's astounding in today's age. So there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but, you know, I see a marked change occurring. Um, yeah. You know, I think when the discussion about gender equality yep. became one that everyone was having rather than it was just females having is when things started to change. And it's amazing how, you know, the power of, um, you know, the male voice uh, talking about gender equality, um, how much power that actually has. So during your career, did you have many mentors to support you to come along, you know, the journey? Oh, I've had um, I've had a huge number of mentors, both informally and formally, and I value the informal as much as the the formal mentoring. So I'm naturally a person that's very curious. I'm naturally a person that likes a challenge. I'm naturally a person that's looking, you know, for things. So I will be taking taking things from everyone that I work with or I come you know across along the way. And a big part of whether it's mentoring or coaching or just, like I said, that informal working with people, you're learning as much about the things that you don't want to emulate as the things that you do uh, along the way too. So I've been really fortunate to have people who have been very generous with their time um, and have learnt a lot from a lot of people uh, over my professional journey. On a more macro point, if we were to call up the PM or the Treasurer, in the next couple of days or maybe even this afternoon of yourself, what would you suggest we need to think, take into consideration? Yeah, well, it's not a, an if. Those conversations are occurring mm. um, between industry, uh, the government, uh, regulators, etc. So we are working together now around how we do get uh, this uh, economy back into a, you know, into a recovery phase but really sort of kicking on. And it's going to take a combination of a number of things. Um, You know, there's structural reform. You know, we touched on a little bit of that uh, earlier on, but um, there's structural reform. Uh, I think there's productivity, efficiencies, and, um, you know, and regional infrastructure investment is a key one. You know, I think from my perspective, and like I said, something that I'm pushing fairly strongly. But it's going to take a number of things, as it took a number of things to ensure that we were looking after individuals and businesses uh, through this period of time. There are a number of measures, not only fiscal, but it's going to, you know, fiscal and monetary, but um, it's going to take a number of things that's going to help to get the economy back to where it needs to be. So you're not, you're not, you're not seeing the, the V, you're, you're seeing more the, the U in that sense, Marnie? Yeah, I do. Mm. I do. I think I, I would love to, the optimistic side of me, I'd love to think it's a V, um, yeah. um, probably more realistic side is a you and and look and there's just still so much uncertainty about where exactly that that will land are you concerned with discussions at the moment regarding some of our offshore trading partners oh i'm i won't be drawn into the political um debate or discussion um you know except to say that we do have to take a a bigger view uh, of things and you know trade is important regardless of who the partners are and, you know, if we are going to, you know, ensure that as an Australian economy that we're operating well, efficiently and, you know, and prosperously, uh, then trade is an important part of that. Money, if you were to look back and give some advice to that young young lady uh, on the farm many years ago, what advice would you give her now? Um, be kinder to yourself. Don't take life too seriously because... Uh, the older you get, you realise the, the, the shorter your life is. So, um, yeah, just be kind to, to yourself. You know, th- there is, you know, one thing that I've always, and I spend a lot of time talking to both men and women uh, about, is that work-life balance, that thing that everyone's trying to achieve or that myth, mythical thing that's out there. You know, I was, I was misled as I was coming through that you could... You know, and females, you know, could have could have it all, could yep. have work and and life and you know everything else outside. Um, but it's a trade off. It's a, absolutely a trade off, and it comes down to an individual what you're willing to trade off against. So every time you make a decision, you're going to that meeting rather than to your kids' um, parent teacher interview or 
you know, whatever it may be, you are making trade-offs and that is life and don't be too hard on yourself. That's just, you know, that is just how it is. You can't be super, superhuman. That's pretty good advice, Marnie. On that, Marnie, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. You've been listening to No Limitations.